and the recording, the slides, and the quick guide will all be posted on the website by the end of this week. If you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box on the slide, and we'll have time at the end to answer some questions. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce James Peck. He's a PsyD um, and a cl licensed clinical psychologist and senior clinical trainer at the UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Program. For nearly a decade, Dr. Peck conducted phase two clinical trials of behavioral and pharmacological interventions for stimulant dependence. Dr. Peck has extensive experience conducting curriculum development, clinical trainings, and clinical supervision on the etiology assessment and treatment of substance-related disorders and on the treatment of individuals with co-occurring substance-related and psychiatric disorders. He currently works at UCLA in a primarily clinical training role and maintains a busy practice treating individuals with co-occurring disorders. Just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, we're a statewide nonprofit dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Um, our work is based on two co basic concepts, one that healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, and the other that schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. We do this um, through various ways, capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like the one you're seeing today. Um, and here's a link to our website. This is also where you will find the recording and the slides for this webinar. Um, just some quick information on our membership. Uh, if you become a member with us, you will get a conference registration discount, also access to member-only tools and resources, and technical assistance that can be tailored to your organizational needs. Um, if you're interested in signing up, you can go ahead and uh, click on this link. Great, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and transfer this over to Jane to take it away. Thank you, Sierra. Glad to see everyone here today. I'm glad you can all make it in these challenging times. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the SAMHSA State Targeted Response Network um, and Technical Assistance Grant Program for partially sponsoring this webinar. Um, and technical assistance is available to support prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorders. Um, each state or territory has a designated team led by a regional technology transfer specialist to help you with to do that. The ORN uh, accepts requests for education and training. And if you'd like to submit a request for education or training or technical assistance, you can do so in a number of ways. You can visit uh, www.opioidresponsenetwork.org. You can email ORN at AAAP.org, or you can call the phone number that's on the screen. I'll leave that there for just a second, in case anybody wants to write those down. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. So what we'd like to do today is to have you be able to demonstrate Knowledge of the relationship, spirit, and micro skills of motivational interviewing. We're going to use motivational interviewing skills and strategies uh, in a brief adolescent substance use intervention using a couple of different models. One is the flow model, FLO model, uh, which we'll talk about. The other is the brief negotiated interview. And we'd like you to be able to, to use that one as well to explore the context of, a, of a, an adolescent substance use and be able to negotiate a collaborative goal and action plan. We'd also like to have you be able to identify strategies for advocating for the implementation of SBIRT in school-based settings. We'll cover a little bit on that toward the end. So motivational interviewing. Um, I'm sure some of you, if, if not many of you, have had some MI training at this point. So this will be a very brief overview of MI skills and strategies. Uh, but with, it's what's going to form the basis of the brief interventions that we're going to talk about. So we might call MOTA MI a style of talking with people constructively about reducing their health risks and changing their behaviors. MI is designed to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. Some really important language in there. Strengthening personal motivation 
we're assuming that, that folks actually have some motivation internally, and it's up to us to help them find it and express it. We're committing to a specific goal. So unlike uh, more unstructured psychotherapy, uh, we're using an approach that has a specific goal. We have a specific target behavior. We want to elicit and explore the person's own reasons for change, again, assuming that they are already are there. And we're going to do it all within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. So unlike what used to be the case with substance use treatment, um, typically used to be a very sort of confrontational approach, here we're going to use meeting people where they are, accepting them where they are, where we find them, and being compassionate toward them. MI is designed to enhance the person's own motivation to change using strategies that are empathic and, as I said, non-confrontational. So there are four elements of the MI spirit. And if you are just starting out with MI, I would, I would really encourage you to just start to practice some of these four elements in your work. Uh, partnership. We're going to meet people where they are and form a partner. So it's not like, yeah, you know, you're the problem. I'm the expert. I'm going to tell you what to do. Uh, it's not that sort of hierarchical approach. Much more meeting people where they are, forming a partnership, saying let's identify the problem here and work on the problem together. Acceptance, we need to be people where they are. We can't expect them to be somewhere that we would like them to be. Um, we need to meet them where they are. We're going to demonstrate genuine compassion uh, along with empathy. Empathy and compassion, really the centerpieces uh, of the MI spirit. We're, we want to try to understand people and in so doing, um, to have some genuine compassion for their situation in life. And evocation is kind of the more, most um, often the most difficult to explain. We're trying to evoke a person's own values and goals and their own reasons for change. So we're trying to you do some ev evocation of someone's, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but someone's more deeply held values and goals and explore how their current behavior fits in with those current values and goals in a very, in a non-judgmental sort of way. So the spirit encompasses uh, these following uh, uh, bullet points. Uh, it's non-judgmental and it's collaborative, as I mentioned. It's based on a student and counselor or clinician partnership. It's what we might call gently persuasive. We're not going to drag people kicking and screaming somewhere they don't want to go. We do, however, have a destination that we're trying to get to. It's more supportive than argumentative. The minute we get into an argument uh, with someone that they, they have, telling them they have a problem, they're arguing that they don't have a problem, we're not likely to get very far. We're doing much more listening rather than telling or lecturing, um, especially with adolescents, a lecturing sort of approach isn't likely to be terribly successful. So we want to listen to them, try to empathize with them with, with their worldview. And the entire approach communicates respect for and acceptance of students. Responsibility for change is left with the student. Um, so we know that we can have an influence on folks and what they choose to do. But ultimately, people are going to make their own choices. And so we're going to leave responsibility for change up to the student. Change arises from within rather than being imposed from without. People are much more likely to engage in a course of action if they themselves have come to the determination that they need to do this rather than if someone else is lecturing at them that they need to do this. The emphasis is on the student's personal choice for their own deciding their own future behavior. So again, we're not going to tell them what they need to be doing. We're going to try to elicit from them a commitment to do something. And a focus on eliciting the student's own concerns about remaining the same. Um, what will happen to me if I keep doing what I'm doing right now? Are there any concerns about that? And can we elicit those? Ambivalence is kind of the, the meat of the brief intervention. So ambivalence is feeling more than one way about something. And all change, and, and especially any sort of making any sort of major change in our lives contains an element of ambivalence. On one hand, we know something might be healthier for us. On the other hand, it's really hard to make that sort of change. Think about 
if you've ever started a, a, or tried to maintain a diet or exercise program. It's, it's often not so, not so difficult to get started, but maintaining it over time uh, often becomes challenging. Certainly with regard to giving up alcohol or drugs, people know that on some level that it would be healthier for them to give those things up. On the other hand, there are a lot of powerful features that maintain those behaviors. And so we need to be aware of that. And we want to help people to explore their ambivalence in the brief intervention. How MI differs from traditional or typical medical counseling. Again, ambivalence is the key issue to be resolved for change to occur. People are more likely to change when they hear their own discussion of their ambivalence, and that's called change talk in MI. So what we want to do is, is facilitating change talk, uh, which is a critical element of the MI process. We want to elicit from folks uh, language that indicates um, their willingness and commitment to ultimately to changing. Good way to explore ambivalence is using something like this. We call this the decisional balance. Um, and it, what we're going to start the conversation off with is tell me some of the good things about your drinking, drug use, whatever it may be. What are people typically expecting to hear from people in authority? Don't you know how bad this is for you? Instead, we're going to start the conversation with what are some of the good things about your, let's say, Vicodin use? What does it do for you? That communicates to the student um, that we are genuinely trying to understand them, trying to understand what role the drug or the alcohol plays in their life. And we, once we have a sense of that, of what role it plays, we'll ask about what are some of the not so good things about your use of Vicodin or alcohol or whatever it might be. We're going to ask them that in the, in the language phrased as not so good, rather than bad or negative, because not so good, said in, in, in a very sort of almost informal way. Tell me some of the not so good things about it. It's less judgmental than saying, uh, tell me some of the bad things or negative things about it. And then what would be some of the not so good things about changing, about cutting down or, or stopping your use of alcohol or drugs? What, would that, what is that going to get us? That's going to get us, what are the challenges going to be? What are the obstacles going to be for this person? And then what would be some of the good things about reducing or stopping your use of alcohol or drugs? Um, and here's where we're going to elicit their own reasons for change. And we're using open-ended questions here. Closed-ended questions pull for a, a simple yes or no answer. Open-ended questions uh, are pulling for a more descriptive response to continue the conversation. Four basic principles of MI, expressing empathy. Uh, as I've said, we're trying to establish a relationship that is based on empathy. I'm genuinely trying to understand the world from your point of view. <clears throat> we're trying to develop discrepancy. We're trying to develop discrepancy between, again, someone's more deeply held values and goals and their current behaviors. So on one hand, you're telling me that you, you want to finish school. You might want to apply to colleges. On the other hand, you're using Vicodin several times a week. Help me make sense of that. We have to be very careful in how we ask that question, because if there's a note of sarcasm in our voice, uh, we're going to be dead in the water. So we have to ask that question as though we really don't understand. Um, it's sort of a, if any of you remember the old TV detective, detective show called Columbo, uh, and remember his style of asking questions, it's almost like that. It's sort of a head scratching. Uh, okay, on one hand, you're telling me that you want to do this. On the other hand, you're doing this every day or several times a week. So help, help me make sense of that. We want to roll with resistance. Um, historically, uh, we're, going to, we're going to really redefine what we mean by the word resistance. So historically, resistance has been met with confrontation. We don't want to do that. We want to roll with resistance. Say, okay, you know what, I can understand that point of view. I can understand how it might seem that way to you. Would it be okay if I share with you a slightly different perspective and how it might be a little bit different from that? And we want to support a sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a sense of if I decide that I want to try to make this change, do I feel like I have the necessary knowledge and skills and ability to, uh, to do that? Um, and it's, a, it's an empowering sort of approach. 
who want to support someone's sense of self-efficacy, their ability to make a change. Okay, then we're going to use the micro, the MI uh, ORs or micro skills in these conversations. Open-ended questions I mentioned a few minutes ago. Questions that call for a more descriptive response that can't just be answered with a simple one-word response. We're going to do some affirmation. Um, and affirmations are important to do. It's important not to overuse them. But on the other hand, it, it is important to try to, to affirm whatever we can. And it may simply be that they were able to come in today. Okay, sounds like you've been having a tough time. But you know what? You got yourself here today. Good for you. Might be something as simple as that. Reflective listening, we're going to spend some time, a little bit of time talking about. Um, reflective listening is really the primary micro skill by which we establish empathy. Um, we're going to listen, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, but we'll, we're going to listen from the perspective of just trying to understand, listening from the perspective of empathy, rather than listening for the purpose of diagnosing and fixing a problem, which is what most of us in the healthcare professions, certainly, uh, and probably some of the educational professions as well, have been taught to do is to listen for the purpose of diagnosing and fixing a problem. And we're going to summarize. And summarize is, summaries are just a sort of a specialized set of reflections. We're going to offer back toward the end of, I think of it as listening to two or three verbal paragraphs. And then I'm going to offer a couple of sentences back, kind of summarizing what I've heard so that they can hear it twice. Reflective listening, as I said uh, a minute ago, we're listening to both what the student says and to what they mean. So we're listening for the underlying meaning in terms of what's being said. And often that is in the form of emotion. Um, often we can pick up on emotion that someone might be feeling, even if they're not necessarily consciously aware of it. We're demonstrating empathy without judging what they have to say. <clears throat> we don't necessarily have to agree with them in order to empathize with them. Okay, I can understand how it makes sense from your perspective to do what you're doing. Um, that's not saying that I agree with it. It's simply saying that I understand why you're doing it. <clears throat> we need to be aware of our intonation with reflection. So we're reflecting with statements rather than with questions. Listen to the difference in the way that I say this. So you couldn't get up for school in the morning versus you couldn't get up for school in the morning. One is a statement, one is a question. When phrased as a question, sounds a little more judgmental. And so we're, this entire approach of MI is really designed to reduce people's defenses, to be non-judgmental, um, so that we can have a conversation, again, uh, in a context of empathy with them. And as I said, we're listening to understand them rather than to diagnose and fix a problem. We're avoiding confrontation. So we're not doing the challenging, the warnings, the finger wagging. Don't you know if you want to be a good student, you need to stop drinking on school nights? Don't you know you're going to damage your liver if you don't stop drinking? Uh, challenging people, what do you think you're doing? Again, we're going to avoid those sorts of confrontational approaches. And we're going to elicit change talk. So change talk consists of self-motivational statements that suggest that first, that there's recognition that there might be something there to look at, recognition that there might be a problem. Is there something here that I need to at least look at? Is there concern about staying the same? What if I continue doing what I'm doing now for the long run? Where is that going to take me? And then we want to see intention to change. So we're listening for change talk. Sounds like, okay, yeah, you know, maybe I should do this. And then ultimately we want to have optimism and a commitment to making a change. So uh, change talk consists of anything that sounds like any of these things. Um, the optimism about change is something we can help to build, as I said, with building their sense of self-efficacy. That will give them a sense of, of optimism about making the change. So what do we want to do with brief interventions? Ultimately, we want to bring about behavior change. The question is, how do we do that? And there, first thing, we need to be aware, need to have awareness that there is a problem. If there isn't even awareness that there's a problem, we're not likely to get anywhere with folks. Then we want to increase motivation and ultimately bring about behavior change. There are a couple of ways we can generate awareness of the problem. That is either the presenting problem, why are they there to see you today in the first place, 
or with the results of the screener. So and last month in our, our screening webinar, we talked about using the S2BI, which stands for Screening to Brief Intervention, and the CRAFT um, as screeners for adolescents. And so we'll use the results of those screeners to start to raise awareness that there might be a problem to look at here. Again, or the other way is, why are they there to see you today in the first place? And can we draw a connection between that and their alcohol or drug use? So conducting a brief intervention, the flow model, the FLO model, looks like this. Uh, and this is the model that the American College of Surgeons Trauma Committee originally designed a number of years ago. Uh, the feedback is the first piece, so we're going to set the stage for the conversation and give them the screening results. Listen and understand is in the middle as really kind of the meat of the brief intervention. We're going to explore the pros and cons of their alcohol or drug use. We're going to discuss the importance of the student's concerns and assess their readiness to take some sort of action. And then the final se section, options explored, we're going to discuss change options um, and, and uh, set things up for a follow-up. So we'll look at each of these in a little bit more detail. So feedback is the first task in the, in the brief intervention. And here we're going to talk about what we call the feedback sandwich. So in each interaction, we're going to ask permission. Would it be okay if we talk about the results of the screening that you just took? Uh, we're going to give them feedback about the screening results. And then we're going to ask for their response, give them a chance to think about what's going on and what we've talked about and give them a chance to respond to it. What we'll cover in the feedback piece is the range of scores and the context for them. Give them their screening results, the interpretation of results like a risk level. So you're at low, moderate, or high risk level. Get their feedback about those results. And we're going to actually say something like this. Scores on the craft range from 0 to 6, plus students score less than 2. Your score on the craft was a 4. Or puts you in the moderate to high risk range. At that level, your alcohol or drug use is putting you at risk, risk for a variety of problems, including eventual addiction to the alcohol or drugs. What do you make of that? Give them a chance to, to sit back for a minute, consider their reaction, and then give, their, give you their response. Some informational brochures that are often helpful. Rethinking Drinking is one that's put out by the uh, NIAAA, National Institutes of Health uh, Institute that focuses on alcohol and alcoholism. And it essentially covers a lot of what we're covering today. And it gives you some worksheets to use to assess your own drinking. Some other good informational brochures, especially for students, uh, the NIAAA has an underage drinking fact sheet, which you can find at this uh, web website. And SAMHSA, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Organ Association, uh, has an underage drinking facts versus myths fact sheet, which is very good as well uh, to give out to students. I'll leave those up there for a second so that you can copy those down if you'd like to. And I think you'll be able to see this uh, after the uh, webinar is over on the slides. Uh, so the first task for feedback, handling resistance. So again, how are we going to deal with what we might call resistance or ambivalence? Listen, I don't have a drinking problem or a drug problem. My dad was an alcoholic or is an alcoholic. I'm not like him. I can quit using anytime I want to. I just like the, I just like the taste. Or everybody drinks in high school. How do we respond to those sorts of statements? We don't want to get into a tug of war, um, and so we're going to let go. Some easy ways to do that, listen, I'm not going to push you to change anything you don't want to change. I'd just like to give you some information. Ultimately, what you do with that is up to you. Would that be okay? Something along those lines. We also might want to try to find a hook, get them involved and connected with us somehow. Ask the student about their concerns. If, if they stay the same, if they continue, let's say, using Vicodin several times a week. Um, we want to provide some non-judgmental feedback or information, if that's appropriate. 
Watch for signs of discomfort with the status quo or interest or ability to change. Are they uncomfortable? Is there any part of uh, my 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 thing just went off. Some somebody is unmuted apparently. Um, if you could mute, mute your microphone, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so we're watching for signs of discomfort with the status quo. How might I be unhappy with the, the way things are now? Or do they have an interest in changing? Or do they feel like they have the, the ability to change? And we're going to always ask the question, what role do you think that your alcohol or drug use plays in whatever the presenting situation is that they're there for in the first place? We're going to let them decide. And just asking the question is helpful. A lot of what we're doing with MI is planting seeds. Seeds don't necessarily sprout immediately, um, not always. And so what we are doing is asking questions that are planting seeds. The second piece of the brief intervention, the listen and understand piece. So we're basing this on the assumption that ambivalence is normal. So again, what we might have in the past called resistance, we're now going to call ambivalence about making some sort of major change. And we know that ambivalence is a normal part of the decision-making process. Some tools for evoking change talk, uh, looking at pros and cons, and something called the importance or readiness ruler, which we'll look at in a little bit of detail. This is the decisional balance that we looked at a few minutes ago, and this is where you would use this. Um, so we've given the student feedback about their screening results, now we're going to have this part of the conversation. So what are some of the good things about your Vicodin use? And what are some of the not so good things about it? And then what would be some of the not so good things about stopping using Vicodin? Uh, and what would be some of the good things about making that change? So again, we want to end up on, in this conversation on the side of what would be good about reducing or stopping your alcohol or drug use. And again, we're using open-ended questions. And this woman is feeling ambivalent again about the situation. Okay, so we're listening for change talk. We're listening for something that sounds like these statements. Okay, maybe drinking did play a role in what happened, uh, in the reason why I'm here, in the accident that I got into, whatever it might be. If I wasn't drinking, this wouldn't have happened. Using really isn't much fun anymore. This is, you will hear this from people who have been using alcohol or drugs for a while, drugs in particular. I can't afford to be in this mess again. Last thing I want to do is hurt someone else. Sometimes hurting themselves or the fear of hurting themselves isn't enough to get people to make a behavior change. But the thought that they might hurt someone else is, I know I can quit because I've stopped before. I've done this in the past. And so I think I can probably do it again. We're listening for things that sound like this, and we're going to summarize it, and we're going to reflect it back to them so that they've heard it twice. Strategies for weighing the pros and cons. Again, these are pretty similar to the decisional balance questions. What do you like about drinking? What does it do for you? What are some of the not so good aspects of it? What else are you aware of about your drinking or your drug use? And we're going to, again, summarize both the pros and cons. So on one hand, you said, uh, that Vicodin helps you cope with your parents arguing all the time, let's say. Um, and on the other hand, you said it sometimes make, make, makes you so sleepy that you have a hard time going to school or you have a hard time paying attention in class. The importance and confidence and readiness ruler. So we're going to probably ask one of these questions in any given conversation. On a scale of one to 10, how important do you think it might be to change your drinking or drug use or to stop your drinking or drug use? Or if they seem like they're a little more, a little closer to being willing to make a decision and make a change, how confident are you that you can do that if you decide that you want to do it? And then if it seems like they're really close to being ready to taking action, you could ask, how ready are you to do this? For each of those questions, we're going to ask these questions. Why didn't you give it a lower number? So scores typically on these questions range from four to six. So why did you give it a four instead of a two or a one? What are people expecting us to ask them? Why didn't you give it a higher number, which communicates 
why isn't it more important to you than it is? Um, instead, we're going to ask them, why didn't they give it a lower number? Why, and so why, why was it important enough to give it a four is what we're basically asking them instead of a two or a one. And then what would it take to bump that up from a four to a five or a six? We wouldn't want to say, what would it take to bump that up from a four to a 10? That's asking them to go too far. So we would say, what would it take to bump that up from a four to a five or six? In other words, see if they can think of one more reason why it might be important to make this change. The payoff for asking the questions is that they will lead to a working treatment plan, essentially. We will have a sense of what stage of change is this person in, uh, are, what are the benefits to them of their alcohol or drug use, what are the consequences of their alcohol or drug use, and we'll know how willing they are to start to work on the issue. And then options explore the final piece of the flow brief intervention. Options for change. So what now? Again, some open-ended questions. What do you think you might do? You wouldn't want to ask all of these, but you would ask one or two of these. What changes are you thinking that you might make? What do you see as your options from here? Where do we go from here? Emphasizing that partnership again. Or what happens next from this point? If they're unable to think of any ideas, then we might offer a menu of options. We might offer them some choices. Well, some people decide that they're going to manage their drinking or their drug use or cut down to lower risk amounts. Some people decide that they're going to stop drinking or drug use altogether. All some people decide that they're never going to drive with someone who's been drinking or using drugs, including yourself. Um, in other words, to reduce harm associated with the alcohol or drug use. Some people decide they're going to do literally nothing, nothing at all. Um, and other people decide that they're going to seek help and get a referral to treatment. So of these options, what feels like it might work for you? At this point, we can also explore previous strengths and resources and successes. Have you stopped using uh, drugs or drinking before? If so, what, what personal strengths allowed you to do it? Again, try to elicit their sense of self-efficacy. Who helped you and what did you do? Or have you made other kinds of changes successfully in the past? Maybe it wasn't about stopping alcohol or drug use, but you've made other, some other sort of significant change in the past. And if so, how did you accomplish that thing? Who helped you? How did you go about doing it? And how might we put those options to use here in this current situation? We want to give advice without telling someone what to do. So, and one good way to do this is by asking permission first. Um, we want to provide clear information uh, if they ask for it. So we know that what happens to some people if they continue doing what you're doing uh, in the long run. Or my recommendation might be that you would cut down, or try to cut down or stop doing this um, as soon as you can. And then elicit their reaction. What do you think about that? What are your thoughts about that? As I said, we want to ask permission before we provide a recommendation or a suggestion. Would it be okay if I give you a suggestion? Would it be okay if I provide a recommendation? Um, give them the recommendation and then ask for their response. Always asking them for their response, getting them involved in the conversation rather than just saying, here's what you should do. And then we want to sew up the conversation. The acronym is SEW. Uh, we want to summarize the students' views, especially what would be the pros of reducing or stopping their alcohol or their drug use. Encourage them to share their views with other people. Helpful to talk about these issues with other folks. And especially if you're going to set a goal of stopping or reducing, uh, important to share that with other people in your life so that they can support you. And then what agreement was reached? Um, what plan did we come up with? and repeated and reflected back to them. Okay, so that's the FLO brief intervention. Another form of brief intervention is called the brief negotiated interview. I'm gonna go over this in general at first, uh, the first run through the brief negotiated interview, and then I'm going to do an example of a student using Vicodin. So in general, here's what we're going to do with the brief negotiated interview. And it's a lot of the same concepts 
as the flow intervention, uh, just structured a little bit differently. So the first step is engagement. We want to engage the student in the conversation. So before we start, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Would you mind telling me a little bit more about yourself? What's a typical day like for you? How do alcohol or drugs fit in? What are the most important things in your life right now? Start the conversation, start to build rapport, start to build that empathy with them. Then start to explore the pros and cons. I'd like to understand more about your use of uh, alcohol, let's say. What do you enjoy about drinking? What else about it do you like? And then what do you enjoy less about it? Or what do you regret about your use of it? If there are no cons, if they can't think of any reasons why that they don't like it, we might explore problems mentioned during the craft. So you mentioned during the craft that you sometimes use alcohol to feel better about yourself or fit in with your friends. Tell me a little bit more about that. So on one hand, you say you enjoy drinking because of whatever their reasons are. And on the other hand, you've also said that it sometimes gets you into this sort of trouble. So we're, again, summarizing and giving it back to them. Then fee providing feedback. I have some information about the guidelines for low risk drinking. Would you mind if I shared them with you? And this is more oriented toward adults than kids, and which is why I did the second example of this, which is more oriented toward adolescents. We know that for adults drinking more than or equal to four drinks for women or five drinks for men in one sitting, or more than seven drinks for, for women or 14 drinks for men in a week, and or use of illicit drugs can put you at risk for illness or injury, especially in combination with other drugs or medications that you might be taking. Provide some medical information if it makes sense here. It can also lead to problems with the law or with relationships in your life. And then elicit their response. What do you make of that? What do you think about that? Here is where we would use the readiness ruler, again, just like we did in the FLO intervention. To help me better understand how you feel about making a change in your use of alcohol or drugs, would actually show them a little ruler labeled zero to 10. So on a scale of one to 10, how ready are you to change some aspect of your use of alcohol or drugs? And then reinforce that. That's great. It means you're, let's say that you give us a five on a scale of one to 10. That means you're about 50% ready to make a change. Again, why did you choose that number and not a lower one? like a one or a two, elicit some more reasons from them. So and it sounds like you have some reasons to change and summarize and reflect that back to them. And then we're gonna negotiate an action plan. We wanna actually write it down. What are you willing to do for now to be healthy and safe? Envision the future. What would you like your life to look like down the road? maybe probes for goals. How does this change fit with where you see yourself in the future? How does this change of stopping alcohol or drug use fit with where you see yourself down the road? Explore the challenges. What are some challenges to reaching your goal? What are the, what, what are the obstacles going to be? And let's see if we can figure out a way to get through those. Drawing on past successes. What have you planned or done in the past that you felt proud of? Who helped you succeed? How can you use that person or method again to help you with the challenges of making this change now? And then what would be the benefits of changing? If you did make this change now, how would things be better for you? And then we're gonna summarize and thank them. We wanna reinforce their resilience and re resources, provide handouts if that is appropriate, give them the action plan that we developed with them and thank them for coming. Let me summarize what we've been discussing, and you let me know if there's anything you want to add or change, and we would review the action plan that we've written down. Present a list of resources. Again, if they were, if part of this is oriented toward a referral to treatment, we might provide a list of resources. Which of any of these services are you interested in? Here's the action plan that we discussed, along with your goals. This is really an agreement between you and yourself. Thanks so much for sharing this, all of this with me today. I know it's hard to talk about these things. 
Okay, and then a more specific example of a BNI using with a team using Vicodin might sound a little something like this. So again, step one is engagement. Just start to build the relationship and the rapport and the empathy with the student. Before we get started, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Tell me a little bit, little bit about yourself. What's a typical day like for you? And then how does Vicodin fit into that? What are the most important things in your life right now? Try to get a sense of what's important to them and maybe we can make use of those things. Again, the pros and cons. I'd like to understand more about your use of Vicodin. What do you enjoy about it? What do you like about it? What does it do for you? What do you enjoy less about Vicodin or regret about your use of it? Again, if they can't think of any cons, any negatives, might explore problems mentioned on the craft. So you said that you have gotten into trouble sometimes while using Vicodin. Tell me a little bit more about that. Or one that I like that is frequently mentioned is um, I use it uh, to fit in with my friends um, and to, or to feel more comfortable with my peers. Um, that's, a, that's a very good one to explore. Summarize what they've said. So on one hand, you enjoy Vicodin because it does this for you. On the other hand, it causes these problems. Provide some feedback. So I have some feedback about the use of opioids by teens that I'd like to share with you. Would that be okay? Again, we're asking permission before we share the information or recommendations. So we would probably say something along these lines. We know the use of opioids by teens has some negative consequences. For one thing, it's very easy to become addicted to them to the point that you need them just to be able to function every day. They can lead to short-term problems like impaired ability to learn, poorer grades, and family relationship issues, along with overdose and death. It can also lead to, to longer-term consequences like collapsed veins um, and respiratory problems and liver disease. We know that teens who use prescription opioids in their early teens, when they're 13, 14, are more likely to be using heroin by the time they graduate from high school. This actually comes from a study that was just published last year, a study of about 3,000 high school students in Los Angeles County that found that Kids who, they, and they, they started when they were freshmen, they started looking at the kids when they were freshmen and followed them through their senior year. And one of the things they found was that those who started using prescription opioids when they were 13 or 14 were much more likely to be using heroin by the time they graduated, which is a little scary. Um, they also found some other interesting um, and substantive things, uh, like a large proportion of students reported symptoms of depression, a large proportion of students reported symptoms of anxiety. And when we think about reasons why teens use alcohol and drugs, these are a couple of important ones. They're trying to cope with depression or anxiety. Something else they found was, I believe it was about 70% of students reported that their parents or someone in their family uses alcohol or drugs. That's an enormous percentage. And it, it says something about the multi-generational nature of addiction. And because your brain is still developing when you're in your teens, opioids can cause changes in your brain that may be permanent and make you more vulnerable to addiction as an adult. What are your thoughts about all this information? Then we would use the readiness ruler. So to help me better understand how you feel about reducing or stopping your use of Vicodin on a scale of one to 10, how ready would you say you are to change some aspect of your use of Vicodin? Reinforce the positives of changing. Again, that's great. It means you're 50% ready to make a change. Why'd you choose that number and not an, a lower number like a one or a two? <clears throat> and then we want, want to reflect their responses. Then we're gonna negotiate an action plan. So we actually wanna write down an action plan. What are you willing to do right now to be healthy and safer? What do you want your life to look like down the road? See if they can come up with some goals. How does stopping your use of Vicodin fit in with those goals? Envisioning the future. Exploring the potential challenges. What might be some challenges in accomplishing your goal with regard to Vicodin? And then draw on past life successes. What's something you've accomplished in the past that you felt proud of? Who or what helped you succeed in that? 
how can you use that to help you with the challenges of making this change now? And then summarize and thank them for coming in. Um, it's hard to talk about these things. Let me summarize what we've discussed and you let me know if there's anything you'd like to add or change and review the action plan with them. We wanna re reinforce resilience and resources and provide handouts if available. If available, present a list of local resources. Again, if this is someone you have deemed based on the S2BI and the craft that it is likely to have a severe substance use disorder, we would want to then pr provide a list of local resources um, for that for the team to check out which of any of these services might be might you be interested in to help you with this give them the action plan okay here's the action plan that we've discussed this is really an agreement between you and yourself thank them for coming in again it's it's difficult to talk about these things i really appreciate that you've been willing to come in and talk with me today okay so those are the two two uh, versions of the brief intervention, and you can really use either one of those. As you saw, there are similar characteristics uh, in each of them, just put together in a little bit of a different way. So let's wind up by talking a little bit about advocating for SBIRT. What we can do with SBIRT is identify adolescents with substance use disorders and link them with specialty care, substance use treatment programs. Only about 5% of adolescents are going to require that. Um, we can educate adolescents down here and the, the folks in the mild to moderate range on the pyramid. We can educate adolescents who are using substances, and uh, one number is about 11.5% using alcohol, 95 using drugs, um, about the dangers of continuing doing what they're doing, and see if we can, again, through the course of a brief intervention, see if we can get them to agree to either cut down or stop their use of alcohol or drugs altogether. Places where we can perform screening and brief intervention. Where can we do this? Medical settings, obviously, are a big one. Medical settings and clinics. But schools are a big one as well. The juvenile justice system is another place that is, that ESPER is being used uh, frequently. Medical settings like pediatricians' offices, in fact. Why should we do prevention for adolescents in school settings? Somewhere around 21% of 10th graders and 35%, so that's a third of 12th graders, report past month alcohol use. That's I've used alcohol sometime in the past 30 days. 16.5% of 10th graders and 23.5% of 12th graders report past month drug use. So it's common. And schools are major sources of behavioral health care for many students. Students are 21 times more likely to visit a school-based health center for behavioral health than a community-based health center. Um, and they're often making visits to treat the negative impacts of substance use, like injuries uh, or infections. Time and resources are essential for SBIRT to succeed. You need to have the space to conduct this, the screening and brief intervention. You need to have some training. One webinar, one training might not be enough. Um, there is a four hour, uh, we have an online at UCLA, a four hour expert training that can be done um, that satisfies the state requirements for performing screening and brief intervention, for instance. Time to deliver the expert service. That's a big issue for a lot of people, um, just trying to find the time and how do we integrate it into the workflow of the school or of the clinic or wherever it is that we're attempting to provide SBIRT. Make the case for SBIRT with school administrators. It's a public health issue. We're not trying to punish students, but we're thinking about it in terms of public health. And we're thinking about it in, in the context of student health and well being, as well as things like improving grades, improving truancy rates, those sorts of things. Yeah, emphasize the potential impact on issues of concern to the school. We want to identify engaged community leaders, if you can, who are concerned with substance use. Um, that can help create momentum to start to tackle the issue. You can go to politicians, local city councils, 
uh, county boards of supervisors, that sort of thing, school boards, nursing associations, school, school health nurse associations, uh, community leaders, and, and enroll parents in the process as well, engage them in the process um, of advocating for implementing screening brief intervention and referral to treatment in your particular setting. Again, emphasize that it's a public health approach to improving student health and wellness, not a just say no sort of thing. And unfortunately, I've got something at the bottom of my screen that is cutting off that one. Uh, launch a public health campaign to increase public awareness. Generate interest among providers to deliver an effort by engaging professional associations, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, might be uh, associations of pediatricians or of nurses or of school nurses. Some resources that can help you um, reference the endorsement of youth effort by national organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. This is something called the Community Catalyst website. Uh, it's an organization that helps people engage in advocacy for various health-related issues, and one of the health-related issues that they work on is ESPERT. Um, some tips for advocates. Um, this is going to be hard for you to write down, uh, but provide some evidence on the effectiveness of ESPERT. These are documents that you can access online. Some other good resources, there's an Adolescent ESPERT Toolkit from Boston Children's Hospital uh, at this link. It's a PDF that you can download for free. And our work at UCLA, uh, adolescentsubstanceuse.org, which was developed in partnership with the Hilton Foundation. Also, really good resources uh, for developing and advocating for ESPERT programs. Okay, um, you can put questions in the chat box, and Sierra, I will let you take it from here. Yes, thank you so much, Jim. I learned so much about motivational interviewing. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the box um, at this time. I'll give people a few minutes to um, type in those questions if they have any. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just preview. This is what our brief intervention quick guide looks like that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. Um, it contains a lot of the information uh, that Jim went over today. And one of the things that we also included, so the first the first section uh, talks about implementation considerations and best practices, and then the second section has um, handouts that providers can use while in the room uh, with a patient to kind of help jog their memory. Um, there's one for BNI, that's the one that's on the screen right now. There's also one for flow. Uh, so, and those will be on the website within this week. Uh, the presentation, the recording, as well as the quick guide. So the que answer to the question, will the presentation be sent out, is that it, it will be posted on the, your website, right, Sarah? Yes, yes. Are there any other questions? I have a question, Jim. Um, sure. For providers that are doing motivational interviewing, and let's say they're new to it, what's like the, I guess, the nugget of information that they should remember? I know there's like a lot of steps. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Is there, is there like, if I'm going in as a provider and I've never done motivational interviewing before, um, what would you say is the most important like thing to remember? Um, hard to break it down into just one or two things, but I think if you could remember Using the spirit of MI, uh, the acronym is PACE, P-A-C-E. So partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. If you could remember those 
four aspects of the spirit of MI. Uh, we're forming a partnership with the student. We're accepting them. We're meeting them where they are. Uh, we're genuinely uh, compassionate toward them, and we're trying to evoke their own goals and their own reasons for change. I think if you could remember those four things, that will get you well on the way toward doing a good brief intervention. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, so um, we will be sharing. This will have both Jim's contact information as well as mine. Um, like I said, they will be posted on our website uh, within the next few days once the recording is available. And thank you, everyone, so much for uh, coming out. After you close out of the webinar, there will be an evaluation that will automatically pop up. It's just five multiple choice questions. If you all could answer those, they're super helpful to us. Uh, the next and final webinar for this four-part series, which will be on referral to treatment, uh, we are tentatively planning for June. The provider who is speaking um, for that presentation is, is very much involved in the COVID-19 response, and so we've had to push that one back out, but we will announce the date when we have it um, through our newsletter, so you can look out there for the final webinar. Uh, thank you so much, and please stay safe and stay healthy. And take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care, folks.